All right, very welcome along to Shattered Lives. I'm Kieran Bradley, standing in for the esteemed Paul Healy, who is still on his holidays. And I'm delighted to be joined today by the Irish Daily Star's crime correspondent, Michael O'Toole. Mick, how you doing? Hi, Kieran. How's things? Not too bad. How's the, uh, how's the week working out for you? Thankfully busy. Uh, I know Healy and I always say this when we're doing the week in review, but there are no quiet weeks in crime. And I, it was I, I bank holiday Monday, which was last Monday. I was sitting there and I was working and I was going... Geez, there's nothing happening and things change just like that. And you just, you, you're like, it's a rocket exploding or going up the, the space. You know what I mean? It's just, just goes from not to 100 in about two seconds. And that's about what happened with Liam Byrne. But we'll, we'll talk about that in, in this week in crime. But yeah, no, it's been another very good and very busy week. Good, good to hear. But yeah, the, when you see certain stories, you just know, well, that's my day completely. <laughs> that's the chessboard completely thrown up in the air. So I, I was on the late and there's a, we have a, a WhatsApp group where all the news editors and reporters talk and I, I, was, I wasn't really paying attention because I thought, right, let's see what's on. And um, she said, somebody's been arrested. A Kenan Head has been arrested in Spain. And then a couple of minutes later, it's Liam Byrne. And that was it. Oh my Jesus, it just exploded from there. It's just one of those things you just don't see coming. It's like, wow. And it just happened so, so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll come to uh, Mr. Byrne a little bit later in the show. Um, but first of all, we had a, a great chat with uh, barrister Darren Lawler from Dublin last week. I was editing it and I must say I was actually really touched by it and inspired. I think his story is great and his interest and knowledge of the issues facing barristers is of real interest. So I'd highly recommend anyone who hasn't listened to it to give it a listen. But uh, he's been inspirational for other reasons this week, Mick, I understand. Yeah, it, it happened very quickly after the pod came out and there was a great reaction to the pod. Um but essentially, I think the day the pod came out or the day after the pod came out, he was in Nace District Court working as a, a, a defence uh, barrister and a woman fell and hit her head. And if, if people will remember during our interview, we, we did talk about Darren. He's, he was a roadie for Aslan and everything, but he was also one of the jobs he did before he became a barrister or while he was studying to be a barrister. He was a healthcare worker in St. James's Hospital in Dublin. And he did first responder, first aid training. So he is a recognised first aider within the bar of Ireland. He's paid to, to keep up his first aid uh, knowledge. So he basically jumped into action and saved this woman's life and performed CPR on her. So, uh, And he used the defibrillator and everything and he did CPR. So he's a remarkable man. His story is really remarkable and I just wanted to highlight another remarkable side on him that he, if he essentially saved the woman's life just shortly after we'd spoken to him so what a man good on you darren uh you've our best wishes and of course the lady who had uh, i'm sure she's uh recovering so i i was just thinking back uh in in a previous life i used to have a job that was involved in politics and usually around this time of year lends the house uh starts to empty out and we start to see politicians on the holidays but uh, it's been the focus of some rather unwanted attention this week mate. yeah and it just it just goes to show you how stories come along so on, on last saturday a 16 year old boy was arrested after trespassing or breaking in the leinster house now we understand he got into leinster now there, look there are significant guards and there's a military police presence in leinster house and the adjacent or nearby government buildings but he got in, and we understand he got in. The National Gallery is right beside uh, Leinster House, and he got over a fence or a, or a small wall in through a window and in that way. So that was a major eruption. And I was working on Sunday, and I got a good line on Sunday about what he did. He took down, there are two flags in the foyer of Leinster House the Irish flag and the European Union flag. He took them down. But I also discovered that he wrote. There is a, a, an original copy of the 1916 pro proclamation signed by Sean T. O'Kelly, who was involved in the 1916 rising himself. He was regularly, he went to and fro around and he was in the GPO, one of the people who definitely was in, G, in, in the GPO. And he later became president of Ireland. So he, there's a signed copy by him and it's it's obviously very rare. So he, he took it down, it was framed, he took it down and it wrote in the back of it. So that was one big story. But as often happens... Stories come back to you as a sort of follow up. So a couple of days ago, I got more information that Gardy seized the young fella's phone. And when they started examining his phone, they realised that he had been in Leinster House a week or so beforehand. And they also established, I, I learned more details that while he was in Leinster House last Saturday, he wrote on the walls and he, he put graffiti on the walls. He wrote, we love you, Mary Lou MacDonald, the Sinn Féin leader, and we love you, Os Osama bin Laden. Abs absolutely crazy stuff. 
But then we also discovered that Gardy, upon examining his phones, his phone established that he had broken into Ivy House, which is the headquarters of the Department of Foreign Affairs. And that was, I think it was around the 20th of May, so a week, maybe a week or so, or a good bit beforehand. And nobody knew about this. And it was only when his phone was examined that they they realised that he had broken into two, to Leinster House and Ivy House previously. Look, there's no, Kieran, there's no two ways of sugarcoating this. These are appalling security breaches. If a 16-year-old kid can do it, and he walked around and say in Ivy House, he, he, he got into senior diplomats' offices and took pictures of very sensitive documents. Now, there was no malice. He wasn't doing it on behalf of a, a state, a, a, a foreign state, or he wasn't involved in terrorism. He was just acting the bollocks, as 16-year-old kids are wont to do. But it's really alarming that he can get in there, and if he can get in there, who else can get in there? So when, when our story appeared, the doo hit the fan. Garda headquarters were very vexed about this because it's a political story now. So, um, you know, there are there will be repercussions about this. Principally, there's going to have to be a security review because you can't have 16 year old kids coming into Leinster House as is their want. It's, a, it's the National Parliament, so it's a very, very serious breach. We thought one was bad, two was really bad, three is appalling. Absolutely. I, I suppose if you want to look on the more optimistic side, I suppose... It, it having something like this happen which ultimately you know no one's been hurt for example uh it might be the best outcome in the sense of if, if a security review is needed then you know the, the, that will prompt this is there any sense because i understand from reading the stories that at the time there was no response from the Gardi, uh from the Arctus or from the department of foreign affairs have we had any developments there do we have an understanding of what's going on now uh, I, I emailed foreign affairs didn't get back to me uh but i and then I, I contacted the Oireachtas as well. They don't talk about security issues, so they didn't comment the first time. And they, they didn't get back to me the second time. It's a hot potato, Kieran. Nobody really wants to talk it, but I do know that once I put the queries in, it hit the fan. So they were. It's not as if they saw the paper the next day. They were well aware of it after I put the queries in. Um. So look, it's a big story and it's a political story and it's embarrassing for the guards and it's embarrassing for the Oireachtas that this young kid can walk in. I'm not going to over-dramatise, you're right. There were no TDs or senators there because it was a Saturday. So, you know, the the risk to any TDs was obviously nil. But if you can get in, who else can get in? I, I just find it very alarming. And I know that Gardaí are alarmed. I put it this way, Gardaí are alarmed by this and there will undoubtedly be, there'll have to be a review because you just can't have this. It's the National Parliament. Yeah, of course. And you would imagine, of course, there would be a bit of pressure from TDs uh, in the instances we've heard over the last couple of years, people coming quite concerned about their safety more more widely. Um, we come on to the next story here. I mean, Paul and yourself had covered the fact that Dundalk and Louth had been subject to a fairly dark month or a couple of months. Um, but I understand there's been a development in the, uh, the case of Catherine Henry in Dundalk. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to mark this. And I suppose it is a week in crime. And Look, it's sub so we're very limited to what we can say, but we can say that last Friday, I was in court in Dundalk last Friday. It was a special sitting at around half nine. And about that time, a man called Luke Henry, of no fixed abode, appeared in court charged with the murder of Miss Henry. Now, today's Wednesday. He was remanded to custody. In, in, in When it comes to murder, the district court, which is where the first appearance is, does not have the power to deal with a bail hearing. So there was no bail application. So he was naturally remanded in custody. He appeared again today via video link from Clover Hill uh, Prison in West Dublin, where he's on remand. And he was he was again remanded. So if Mr. Donnelly wishes to go to seek bail, it's a matter for the High Court. But I just wanted to mark that a man has appeared in court charged with the murder of Mrs. Uh, Henry. Well, we come on to, I suppose, the most dramatic story of this week in terms of uh, the stories that we would tend to cover most widely, and that's the arrest of Liam Byrne. Mick, I imagine this has been a very frenetic week for you. It's a fast-moving case. You might just give us an update of what's been happening there. Yeah, so I'll just go into the background for people who don't know. Maybe some people don't. He was, he, he had been... Liam Byrne was David Byrne's brother who was murdered in the Regency Airport Hotel and we know that Jerry Hutch was charged with that murder but was acquitted by the Special Criminal Court on April 17. Liam Byrne himself was regarded as a serious criminal. The High Court in Ireland ruled that he was a serious criminal. The Criminal Assets Bureau gave evidence and they seized several million euro worth of his assets and they said that he was in charge of the Byrne Organised Crime Group which is an offshoot or a franchise of the Kinnan Organised Crime Group. Essentially, 
he, he fled Ireland, he left Ireland around 2017 and he'd been living in England, moved from England la- probably last 18 months ago, went to Dubai. We know lots of Kenyan heads, not even the Daniel and the others, but we know there's lots of serious Kenyan players who are in Dubai. It's their sort of bolt hole at the minute. Hills of the Hunt, for some reason, on the 26th of May, he flew from Dubai to Mallorca in uh, at one of the Spanish islands. And last Sunday, he was arrested by the uh, Spanish National Police on foot of a request by the National Crime Agency in England for his extradition. He's to be charged with firearms offences. So I think it's fair to say this was a seismic arrest. For, just for anybody who doesn't know, Liam Byrne is regarded as the man who leads Daniel Kinnan's drugs network in Europe. Kenyon's all over there, so he's the man who runs the operation of getting the drugs in. That's what Gardy would say. So his arrest is a is a, a major blow to the Kenyan organised crime gang. We know that seven Kenyan organised crime players, alleged players, have been sanctioned by America. Five million dollar uh, bounties on Daniel Kenyon, Christopher Kenyon, and Christy Kenyon said. Now, interestingly, although Liam was a senior player in the Kenyan cartel, he was not one of the seven sanctioned people, and I always wondered about that. So. Um, it's really hard to underestimate how important this is. Um, we, I spoke to a man called John O'Driscoll, who was the Garda Assistant Commissioner who set up the sanctions scheme. Now, he retired last year. He told us in the Star that he believes there will be other significant arrests. Now, he did mention, he said, look, every jurisdiction, the Americans, the Spanish, the Irish, the English, the law enforcement moves at a different pace. So that's why it's taken probably two years for Liam Byrne to be arrested and charged. But he said, this is a sign that there are other investigations underway separate to the sanctions investigations. And he foresees other senior players being arrested. But I do think it's fair to say, and he also said, he thinks it'll put pressure on Kenan himself and that the power of the Kenan cartel will be diminished by this and has already been diminished by the sanctions that were put on them. He talked about, and I think this is a very good point that you know, his arrest, he flew from Dubai to uh, Mallorca. And that, for Mr O'Driscoll, that shows that it's very difficult for the Kenyans to move around because they get caught. So uh, it's it's really, really significant. I think we'll, we'll probably talk about Justin Kelly, who's the current assistant commissioner who took over from John O'Driscoll. He was doorstepped yesterday about a thing called Operation Thor, which is a, a, a crackdown in burglaries, but he was asked about the Kenyan arrest. Now, he said... And it, it's really interesting from an outside perspective because for years, no Garda would talk about, would name the Kenyans on the record. I, for example, I interviewed John O'Driscoll a couple of years ago and we kept pushing him about Kenyan and he just wouldn't bite. He wouldn't name Kenyans. Now they're all talking about the Kenyans after they were sanctioned. So Mr. Kelly, who leads up serious uh, unorganised crime investigations, did talk about how significant in the hierarchy Liam Byrne was. And he said this is part shows our continued emphasis on tracking this gang down and in dismantling the gang and he did say that he was a very very significant player in the organisation so and he just basically said we the our our campaign against the Kenyan cartel will not abate so I think that chimes in with what John O'Driscoll was saying there are investigations that we don't know about we know about the sanctions I think there are investigations underway that we will only know about when we wake up one day and we get a news flight. yeah it It's very interesting that you were talking about Liam Byrne in operational terms because, say for example, back in the day during the Troubles, they used to talk about the organisational structure and resilience of uh, the IRA and um, when they were moved into kind of cells, for example, it became a lot more resilient, a lot less um, liable to people, uh, supergrasses and the like. This might not be a question that you are able to ask, but you might have been able to glean from from the Guardi. In terms of the sophistication, I suppose, of the kind of organisation itself, in terms of actual operations, in terms of importing and exporting drugs, do we have a sense of where the Kinnans are and where they were, I suppose? Right, so they, the, the Kinnans were valued, at, their worth was a billion euro. Now, that's a very, very big organisation. So they're involved in large scale drug smuggling. And I remember talking to a man called Michael O'Sullivan. He's been on the pod a few times. He was a former, another former Guard Assistant Commissioner who went to run an organisation called MAOKEN, which is the European's anti-drug smuggling, European Union's anti-drug smuggling organisation, which is based in Lisbon. And they're the ones who capture, you know, tons of, of cocaine. And, and he was just saying that the Kenyans, they don't bring in five or ten kilos they bring in a thousand kilos. So they're now doing mega shipments. And I always remember him saying, 
The hard part is getting it from Colombia or Peru or whatever to Europe. Once it gets to Europe, once it clears a port in Europe, it's broken up and it's virtually impossible to be for them to, to capture it because it's just broken up so much. So that's why you've had these a large amount of multi-ton seizures on the high seas do, do, uh, committed by Mac. And what do you, I always remember every time there's a big seizure, say eight million euro worth or whatever, Mick, Mick O'Sullivan would always say, the, thing, the Kenyan's fingerprints are on this because you would not have a, a shipment this big coming into Ireland without the Kenyans involved in some way. Not directly, but they finance things, they organise shipping shipments for other organisations. So the Kenyans are a very sophisticated organisation. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Now, for 10 years, they had the upper hand. Absolutely, say from 2007 to 2016, they had the upper hand. It was only when the uh, Regency happened and the real bloody response of the Kenyans to the murder of David Byrne that I think Gardy really tried to take them on. And they have taken them on and it's been hugely successful. I mean, John O'Driscoll will tell you that, say, they prevented 70 hits. Most of those hits since the, the Regency, they prevented 70 hits, guard the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau. Most of those hits, maybe 50, have come from the Kenyan cartel or foiled hits. That shows you how big they are and it shows you how big the Garda operation has been to them. But look, they're degraded. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But Nico Sullivan would have said this. They're still involved in drug smuggling. They've still got contacts with the, the uh, Colombian cartels, the mega cartels. So they're still there and they're still very, very dangerous. But there's absolutely no doubt they're under pressure like never before. OK, just to come back to Liam Byrne specifically, do we have a sense of what happens next in the kind of uh, short to, to medium term? Yes. So we knew. So he appeared in court on Tuesday as a procedural thing. And he indicated on Tuesday that he is opposing the, the British authorities' efforts to have him extradited. That's his right. So it has to go to a hearing. You'll remember that Jerry Hutch did the same. He opposed Ireland's bid to get him extradited, so it had to go to a full hearing. So essentially, there'll be evidence given. He'll be able to say, I, I really shouldn't be sent. And then the judges will, will decide. For what it's worth, I think it's inevitable that he's going to be extradited. There might be a loophole, but I think we're 95% sure he will be extradited. So... It, it it could be a month, it could be two months, it could be three months, it could be four months. It all depends on how long the whole procedure lasts. But I think he will be extradited. Now, he is charged that the, the charge, now, as I said in the previous but they're extradited him, which means they have decided to charge him already. You cannot be extradited for the purpose of questioning. So there are charges and we know that it's possession of firearms. But my understanding is, which carries a 10-year sentence, okay, up to 10 years. But I understand that there's consideration for uh, conspiring to pervert the course of ju- pervert the course of justice, and also possessing weapons with intent to endanger life. And if that happens, you're talking twenty two years. So the stakes are very high for Lamburn. There, there's no doubt about that. But I, I I I think he will be extradited. It will be before the end of the year, and he'll go on trial probably early next year. And we might we'll we'll, we'll talk about this. It all comes. This evidence is separate to the the. Sanctions, it comes from a thing called EncroChat. And we have spoken about this. That was a confidential chat bot app that that criminals used. The Kenyans were one of the first adapters of this. They used it for years. They thought it was safe. French and Dutch police cracked it around 2019. They have millions of messages and they have seen dozens of people, for example, charged under Operation Venetic in England. So they have been using the uh, the, the data which was given to every police force in Ireland, in the world, in Europe, including Ireland, and they've been using it as evidence. Not one case has been brought to evidence in Ireland. And we have a clip from Mr. J- from Justice uh, Justin Kelly, who's the Assistant Commissioner, which I think explains why. OK, well, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Justin Kelly now. Well, what I would say is, obviously, in public, I'm not going to talk about our exact strategies to, to take down these groups, but we use all forms of intelligence um, to, I suppose, to feed our operations to take down that group. Yeah, so what's interesting about that? He used the word intelligence. Now, I've been banging this drum for two years because people have been saying, why aren't Gardaí charging anybody and bringing anybody to court and using EncroChat data? And I've always been of the belief that Gardaí did not want to use this as evidence. In other words, something they have to bring to court. They wanted to use it as intelligence because that means they don't have to bring it to court. They can just say, we got this, we got this and this, and you can find seizures and everything. And I think what Justin Kelly's there essentially confirms that. He basically said we're using, my reading of what he said there is, we're using EncroChat as intelligence. And I think I know why. 
Irish courts who have a written constitution, they're much more robust. If you remember, say, during the Jerry Hutch trial, there was a legal challenge to the National Surveillance Unit evidence. Now, that was declared legal, but it was eventually allowed in. And I just think that the guards thought, right, if we use this anchor chat in courts, somebody will mount a challenge. It could put the whole thing back for years. I mean, if you look, say, if you remember under the Graham Dwyer ruling, the High Court ruled that it was it went against European law to use phone data and evidence. So I think that probably scared them a wee bit. And I thought, right, okay, you know, let's be like water. Let's not use it as hard evidence. Let's use it as intelligence. And I think it has worked because I think all these seizures and everything that has happened in the last couple of years has come from EncroChat. Yeah. So I remember that uh, being a massive breakthrough when they kind of got into this system, if you like. Uh, I suppose the things that would give me pause now is if if I'm a criminal and I'm not <laughs> and I was using that phone or that network if I found out that that was happening I would be immediately shutting down operations and moving to another network albeit of, of course they are harder to come by which is why they're using EncroChat do we have really a sense of how far that's happened whether it's happened uh, are they moving to other networks and the like well you see in a way it it's too late for them because I'm talking the French and the Dutch. I think they had billions of messages going back years. So it's not even if you stop it, it's too late then because they have all the evidence and intelligence against them. So there was an Irish fellow called Thomas Maher who was involved with the Kenning cartel. He was from Offaly, but he was living in Cheshire and he was done from by Encrochat. He had all his texts about, yeah, we need this and I can get everything. And, you know, he was really boasting about his importance. So... And it's not as if they realised then Crochet was dead. Oh, we better stop using it. By that stage, they had all the evidence and intelligence they needed. They did. There are other versions of Encrochet, but I know another one was broken by the Australian authorities. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's like a war. They do one thing and the authorities do another. I think, essentially, this has really damaged the use of Encrochet type bots or phones. I think criminals have gone back to the old days of talking to people and ringing people on burner phones and using, you know, call boxes and that sort of thing because they just can't trust technology i think they were really 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 badly bitten by EncroChat. so i think that's the end effectively the end of most of these phones well we just found a new plugin for chat gpt anyway if, uh, if they're looking for one <laughs> so just uh, on, on uh, another point so mick you're in the next couple of weeks going to be heading to lebanon a beautiful country a very troubled country in a lot of ways um, I understand there's been a, an update in terms of the case of uh, Sean Marini. Yes, so this is a very interesting case. Sean Marini was murdered on the 14th of December last year in Alakbiya. He was heading from uh, Camp Shamrock on the southern Lebanese border with Israel or the frontier, with Israel called, Israel called the Blue Line. He was heading to Dublin, uh, Beirut Airport to drop off a, a, a contingent of soldiers who were heading back to Ireland for a break. Ambushed, he was murdered and Trooper Sheen Car- Carney from Cork was very seriously injured. Now, essentially, there has been an investigation underway ever since then. Two very senior Gardaí were sent from Dublin to help. The The Irish investigation, there's a Lebanese investigation, there's a UN investigation, and there's an Irish investigation, all came together. Essentially, there was big cooperation. And uh, uh, just last week, a Lebanese judge cha- formally charged five people. They actually charged seven few months ago we, we we broke that story but they've reduced it to seven now the significant aspect is they named the killer he's in custody a man called Mohammed Ayed he's alleged to have used a, a Kalashnikov rifle to shoot seven fire seven shots at the jeep that uh, uh, was being driven by the Irish and was attacked um, so he's been charged there are four on the run but they've all been charged at the same time now really interestingly he has said that Hezbollah that they were all Hezbollah members now Hezbollah is is a massive political and military force in Lebanon. They were involved in the 2006 war with Israel and it was very bloody. The Israelis, Israelis really suffered and Hezbollah really suffered, but it was almost a stalemate and people were surprised about how well Hezbollah did, I think, because they, you know, they, they put it up to the Israelis, we'll put it that way. They destroyed several Merkava tanks, which were seen to be impregnable, like the Abrams in America. So it was, you know, they're a very, 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 very important organ- organisation in Lebanon. So anyway, Hezbollah have come out and said they didn't do it. But this judge has said, no, they're all Hezbollah members. So there's a bit of to and fro that Hezbollah are now saying, no, this is nonsense. These people weren't our men. But look, it's going to, something that's going to keep on going. I'm heading over to Lebanon with the 122nd Infantry Battalion who are there at the moment, who took over from uh, the 121st uh, uh, just a few months ago. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I just thought it was noteworthy that these five men have been charged and the trial will be ongoing. 
Absolutely. And our thoughts, of course, go out to Piper Rooney's family. Uh, a beautiful country, but very troubled, as we say. And on, on that, um, as we begin to wrap up here, um, of course, the focus has been on the Kinhans uh, as a family and as a as a cartel. Uh, I understand they've ramped up a bit of pressure, the Gardi, on the so-called family. Uh, you might just give us a bit of an update. Yeah, so the family are a very major drugs gang. We can't name them. And as I always say, I really don't like nicknames, but we'll have to call them something. We can't just say the West Dublin drugs. It just doesn't work. So we call them, they're called the family because they're led by two brothers. And they're from the Clindalkin area. Very significant players. I did a story a few weeks ago. They send about 10 million euros out of Ireland every month for money to, to launder. That's 120 million euro. That's a, an awful lot of money. They're very, very significant. Now, unlike the Kenyans, who brought a huge amount of guard attention on themselves by prosecuting the war against the Hutch gang and killing innocent people. So they became massive targets. The family are very uh, much beneath the radar. Now, they are. there's a guy called Gary Carey who was murdered last year. Their fingerprints are on that, along with another crime group. But normally they don't go into murders. They're too busy making money. So uh, just last week, there was a series of raids in North and West Dublin. And the family, along with another gang, the family were the main targets of that and the guards got €200,000. But what's more significant, it was one of their money laundering routes or money laundering schemes and it's been blown wide, blown wide open. So that was a major blow to them. But I think we'll see more of this because as the Kennehans are weakened and as the Kennehans play less of a role, especially in Ireland, the family are coming to the fore. We know that they're a massive target for the Guardi, and I think this will be the first. There, there have been other successes against them, but I think it's going to be ramped up in the coming year because they are getting very big. Well, Mick, uh, as I said to you there a couple of weeks ago, I think I had you number four or five on the list of people who was likely to usher in some form of international incident. But of course, you've managed to stick yourself right at the top with this Disneyland Paris story. So, um, yeah, you might just give us a bit of uh, an update on on your diplomatic <laughs> snafu. I, I, yes, I, I, I was, I wasn't. No, I was slightly annoyed about it because. The Minister Harris, he's now gone, but he was interim justice minister. He came out and he said, we all need to step back from this. Do you remember the story was we we got information from the French ambassador that Guardi were sending officers to Disneyland, amongst other places in France this year. And that story, the help tourists, and that story blew up. I mean, it, my, I didn't see it coming and it was asked in the doll. There were questions in the Public Accounts Committee. People went absolutely bloobers about it. And guards went bloobers about it as well because there, there's a, a problem with resources. So the minister came out, and I can't blame him. He said, we have not been asked this. And that's grand. But he said that, but not because of him, but people sort of assumed that my story was wrong. Oh, no, no, it, that it was bullshit. So a couple of days later, I was given the original guarded document, which we printed in the star. And I was so relieved because on it it said, we want to send Gardy to, to Disneyland in Paris. So that was me happy. But, it, but they also wanted to send guards to Spain, Galicia in northern Spain, and also to Split in, in Croatia. Now, the Garda Press Office told me that they cancelled Spain and they cancelled Split, but they are still very much going ahead with plans for France. Whether or not it'll be Euro Dis Disneyland, it's still up in the air, but we'll keep an eye on it. But I just wanted to sort of say we were, we were vindicated and we got that just to show it in case anybody heard what the minister said and wrongly assumed that our story was wrong. What the minister was saying was the guards haven't asked us about this. So I just wanted to say, you know, we were right. Needless to say, you had the last laugh, Mick. So. <laughs> I won. <laughs> because you know what? I'll tell you what, Kieran. there's nothing worse yeah. than your story being wrong. It is, I, I've been wrong. It is ultra lonely and it's a very, very, terrible position it's just shocking you know you're sitting there you feel everybody's looking at you so I got a wee bit thick and I was going no it, it fucking is right I know it's right so we got the paperwork and they showed it was right so I just couldn't let it lie yeah my uh, it, honestly there is nothing worse it feels like your stomach's about to fall out of your body in fact uh, there was an instance of this where I uploaded the wrong episode about three weeks ago and then had to wait about five hours because of the time difference Clown, uh, okay. Well, listen, Mick, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a great chat to you. And um, if I don't speak to you beforehand, enjoy Lebanon as far as you can. And have a great time. Before we go, can I tell you about my worst fuck up? Please do. Oh, let, sorry. Let me just get the popcorn here for a sec. There, there, there have been horrendous ones. But uh, years ago, uh, Malcolm MacArthur, I was working on a Thursday. So we, we do long week and short week. And the Thursday was my short week. So I was finishing. Five o'clock, the news came up. Malcolm MacArthur was being moved from Mountjoy to Shelton Abbey Open Prison. Grant. So I did a 500 word piece 
about the story and then a 500 word background story. And people will remember it was called Gooby because uh, he, he, he was arrested in the then Attorney General's house, John Connolly. So that was all grand. Mr. Connolly was a very august barrister. So I was writing about MacArthur. He was convicted of one murder, but there was another murder that there was Nolly Prosecco. It stayed on the books. Um, so I said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was writing the whole background and I said, MacArthur later pleaded guilty to one murder and another murder was kept on the books. But of course, didn't I say John Connolly later pleaded guilty to one oh. murder uh, and another, right? And I swear to God, I can feel my guts empty and now thinking about this. It appeared in the paper. I said, oh, sweet Jesus Christ, right? So we're, so we're calling an esteemed attorney general, a senior counsel, a double murderer in the paper. But you know what? He's, he's dead now, God love him, but he was absolutely fantastic about it. He said, I don't think anybody's going to believe that. But it was just a, a complete a slip of the keyboard and it's like, oh my God, I can still remember my editor ringing me. You know when you get a call half eight in the morning? You know you're Ban Jackson. I said, oh Christ, what's this? And he told me and my world stopped. The subs have to take a bit of a uh, bit of flack there as well. But anyway, we'll... uh, <laughs> anyway, that has actually given me whatever the whatever the sort of shame equivalent of the of like a contact high. That's what I've got from hearing that. My stomach's actually churning. Mick, listen, thanks for your time. We'll hopefully have uh, Paul back next week at some stage, so you won't have to slog through this boring voice. But crack on. Yes, so. yes and I, I, and and just to the 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 point out or the flag up. We did, an, I did an, a fantastic interview with Anna Sergi, an expert on, on mafia, and we w- should be running that on Monday. But it was really, really interesting and really, really fascinating. I'd, I'd, I'd like to highlight that coming up on Monday. Yeah, it was. It was a great chat. Um, and we'll speak to you next week. Cheers for listening. Cheers. <laughs>